All right. Hey, everyone. It's John again with FMS. And today I'm excited because I'm here with Addison Wigan, who's a good friend of mine. Um, Addison founded Aurora Financial, um, a company pretty much everyone in the industry knows. Um, he was executive publisher for 17 years. And now he is uh, started a new project called the Wigan Sessions. Um, and I'm just really excited to have you here today, Addison. Yeah, John. It's good to see you. Good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we had a great conversation a couple of years, I guess, three years back. COVID throws my years off really bad um, in London. Um, and, you know, it's funny because whenever I think of you, I actually think of like a newsletter writer sitting in the West Bank in a cafe writing. Like you just have this this image in my head of um, a very intellectual approach to the industry. Um, like the ideas actually matter to you. Um, and I think that's one of the things that really differentiates you over the years. Um, you guys started the first email newsletter in the business, in the, in, on the internet, I should say, right? Yeah. Uh, well, we believe it is. Uh, back in, well, we started in 1999. Um, we were a print publishing company back then, and the internet was starting to make a lot of uh, a lot of people nervous in the print world uh, because we didn't know what the medium was going to do to our business. Um, and Bill Bonner, who's the founder of Agora, um, he actually resigned uh, his post as publisher of a group of newsletters and started writing emails on a daily basis to his publishers, the other publishers within Agora, trying to explain what he thought um, the, you know, the onset of the inter internet was going to do to our business. And at the same time, he was kind of, um, you, you know, encapsulating the ideas he had about what was happening in the markets. And uh, we got the idea that if he's going to be sending that out, we might as well send it to readers too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Daily Reckoning was born. And over a period of about five years, uh, Bill had moved his uh, family to Paris at that time in order to um, in order to kind of separate himself from the day-to-day -day business and really focus on how the internet was going to change our business and uh, more specifically how uh, email was going to change our business. Um, and over the next five years, uh, I, I moved my family to Paris and we worked together and we developed the format that eventually became uh, the Daily Reckoning. And we discovered that, I mean, this is old news now, but nobody was doing it at the time. We discovered that all of the tools, the copywriting and the marketing ideas that we had used in print worked even better in email because it was more immediate. You could be more personal, which is a, a hallmark of our business. And um, we, it, we could send out more mail at a way cheaper price. More often, um, you know, we used to have back in the old print days, we had doubling days and they were like seven to 14 days out because you had to drop it in the mail and it had to get delivered. And then you had to get, get your <clears throat> responses in the mail and then you had to count them. So you, you didn't even know for like a week or more whether your, your ideas were going to work. Right. And also it was very expensive because you had to send it to a printer and get it printed and do blue lines and all that kind of stuff. That's how I came up in the business. Um, when we started doing uh, email, we, we would write it. Um, we would kind of co-write it and I would edit it and then we would send it out and we would get orders within, <laughs> within you know, a few hours. So uh, it really changed our perspective on the business. And um, I think at the time, maybe Agora was like a $20 million a year business and um, in a very short period of time, we grew to over a hundred million, then it was 300 million. And, and we've sustained that, that pattern of growth uh, for over 20 years. And um, now it's global and um, we've got offices in, I don't even know how many now, there's like 15 different countries. And we're, we, we use the same sort of marketing techniques and stuff to promote travel and financial products, health, um, real estate. There's a, there's a number of things that we do now. Yeah. And it all came from sitting down and trying to figure out how to use the medium. So I was a publisher for 17 years um, for Agora Financial was just one of the publishing units within, within the Agora empire. And um, we ourselves grew to over 300 million uh, by 2018 
we found it in 2004 and grew every year until 2018. Uh, and then at that time, I decided we had grown. We had over 300 employees. It, it was, I became more of a manager than a writer. I wasn't that. Uh, I wasn't that intellectual sitting down behind the computer any longer. I was managing groups of people. Um, so we created imprints. So we founded uh, a number of different companies within Agora Financial, Three Founders Press, St. Paul, uh, Paul Research, and Paradigm Press. Mm -hmm. And um, and we broke the publishing units into three, and uh, and we went on from there. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say <laughs> it actually didn't work because each of the publishing groups sort of took, uh, took a life of their own. And um, <clears throat> we've now reconsolidated some of the assets because we had multiple teams doing the same stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then it just became a sort of a management uh, nightmare. Yeah. Um, but in, in that process, I learned a lot and I became less of a manager and I started writing again. And then the pandemic hit. Um, mm -hmm. And I took the same approach that Bill did back when he was trying to learn how to use, um, use, the, uh, use email to communicate with his publishers. I started doing Zoom meetings just like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And um, mostly just so I could stay in touch with the editors and people that I knew in the industry like you. Uh, and I just tried to use uh, these Zoom meetings as a way to, um, to understand how people were dealing with the changes that were going on caused by the pandemic, what was happening in the economy. I was mm -hmm. interviewing like hedge fund managers and um, our editors like Jim Rickards and George Gilder. Uh, Bill himself, I talked to him a bunch because I was really just trying to figure out what was going on. And I was isolated like everyone else. Um, but then having had the experience with the Daily Reckoning 25 years ago now, um, I thought this would be a good thing to, to send to readers too because they would want to know what's happening uh, to within Agora because they're subscribers. And, uh, and then I had this strange experience. We were, um, we were working in the fishbowl, which is in uh, 808. You've, you've seen it. It's yeah, a, yeah. just a big op open room with glass and it actually has a fish tank in it. And uh, we were working, we, me and uh, Judd Anglin and um, Rick Bernard were working in, um, in that room. And we were the only people in the building. No one was going to the office during the pandemic. Uh, and but we were going in every day just because it, it was empty. The building holds 82 people, and we were the only three people there most days. <laughs> but we were, it was a Friday, we were getting ready to go home, and uh, there was a tornado warning, which never happens in Baltimore. But it was like there was a double lockdown, we were locked down because of the pandemic, and then we were locked down again. That told us not to go outside because there was a tornado warning. So it was late on a Friday. So what did we do? We opened a bottle of wine. We started drawing out ideas on the uh, whiteboard <laughs> and the Wigan sessions were born. We're like, hey, we should take this, uh, take all of this content that we have that we've recorded and turn them into, um, into a series of interviews that we can uh, send to readers. So we've been doing that now for uh, oof, about, um, well, a little bit over two years. So we have, um, I think we have 80 something uh, Zoom calls and we turned it into a podcast too. We started stripping the audio and we have uh, 54 uh, podcasts posted already too. Nice. So it's pretty interesting. It's been fun doing it. I've had to learn, uh, we normally in Agora Financial, we had our own camera crew. We had our own audio team, <laughs> but I, the, none of those people were around. So I had to teach myself, uh, you know, how to set up a studio and all that kind of stuff. So it's been fun learning the, the process as well. <laughs> That's awesome. I think when I think about you guys though, like I think, you know, Agora Financial in particular, and obviously Agora as a whole and your work over the years, like I think of it, you, what, the, the word that comes to mind is just really influential and in, in, in across a few different big areas, right? So like when you guys came online with uh, the Daily Reckoning, um, you know, you also, besides catching the trend of the internet in general, like you were also were coming from the most appropriate marketing kind of approach, which is direct response marketing, right. direct mail at a time when people didn't really realize that the internet was going to be a direct marketing medium. Um, and so over the years, obviously all the, all the other marketing things out there, uh, 
kind of like, you know, traffic and conversion, digital marketer, they always kind of looked to what you guys were doing as like, this is the holy grail. You guys are the biggest, the best at, at, at this business about the information publishing, information marketing. Um, and you're doing it at a scale that nobody else was doing. Um, and so obviously the, the, just the internal approaches you guys have taken from having front end, you know, the marketing side with front ends and back ends that were kind of translated from the direct mail publishing days to a real hard focus on copy, um, uh, ongoing engagement, all these different things, um, became like, I'd say like a lot of the backbone of how the current generation of marketers, who even if we don't even know about financial publishing and Gore in general now, they, it's influenced them. It's, it's changed how internet marketing is done, I think, because of the success and influence that you guys had. Yeah, in the early days, we had to do it internally because there wasn't, you know, we were learning as we were going along. And then when we thought we knew something, we would start teaching, uh, we teaching ourselves, of course, but also then we were hiring and, and trying to train copywriters. And we were training them in the in the tr tradition of direct marketing that we learned in the print days. But then we were learning how to adapt um, like order forms and that kind of thing. Like we were taking the, the concept of direct marketing in print and then trying to apply it to um, to the internet. And most of what was happening in the early days was uh, really the brainchild of Bill Bonner and Mark Ford. I know you had Mark on, on your, uh, your program not too long ago. Um, yeah, he was bragging to me that he got there first, talking <laughs> to you. <laughs> but uh, they, they were really the leaders in uh, developing our internal marketing and uh, copywriting education programs. Like we went on seminars in France where we, we were in retreats and we were learning about headlines and leads and all that kind of stuff and how to construct offers and, and those things. That was really in the early days. And, and there weren't a lot of people in the industry teaching uh, methods outside of the, of the business. Um, one of the things that, they, that grew out of that early internal education was the American Writers and Artists um, program, which ha helps teach copywriters to uh, become freelance and then you know, apply their wares wherever they can find clients. Um, That's actually right. So that, and that grew the into, yeah, and that grew into its own business. Um, but I think that uh, one important thing to note is that in our business, there's a high degree of entropy. Like when we learn something and then we start using it, people look at it and they're like, hey, I can do that too. And then they, they start adapting uh, to the, whatever techniques we might have developed to their own purpose. So they discover new things. And then, uh, then things like uh, traffic and conversion, like the industry kind of grew up and everybody was feeding off each other. We may have been there uh, in the beginning trying to teach ourselves internally, but um, after a while, we would go to the same conferences that you go. We, that's how we became friendly because we were going to, uh, to a marketing summit, uh, and then we hosted some events together. Um, we got as much out of the industry. Um, it was kind of for a while, it was sort of an echo chamber, but then it started growing. And then, and then like you say, there's a lot of people that don't, aren't even aware that a lot of the techniques and stuff that, that are being uh, circulated around the industry um, initiate, were initiated because we were just trying to figure out how to apply direct marketing techniques um, for our own purposes. And it worked really well uh, for a lot, of, uh, a lot of different publications and Affiliates and even within Agora, the different um, publishing units adapted uh, new techniques, and we we're very competitive in the, in the industry. And um, I mean, even within the Agora Empire, we're competitive with one another. Another. So when we would develop new techniques, we wouldn't necessarily share them, but then just by watching what other people are doing, you you, you learn and adapt. And I think that yeah. that's that's been the most important thing about working with the internet is. Uh, our ability to innovate and try new things. We can try things uh, at a much cheaper rate than we ever could before and much more quickly. So, you know, one of our mantras is fail quickly and learn as much as you can, as quick as you can. So uh, mm -hmm. these mediums, you know, we're now I've started <laughs> trying to figure out how to speak properly on camera and stuff like that. Uh, the medium allows you to fail quickly 
it was funny. I got a piece of reader mail from the Wigan sessions not too long ago. And he said, I just ramble. And, um, you know, I'm a much better writer than I am a, a speaker. <laughs> and um, the problem with you people at Agora, no, he said, the problem with you people at the Daily Reckoning, because I think he was uh, reading the Daily Reckoning also, is that um, the, the barrier to entry has dropped to zero. <laughs> so now you could just say whatever you want and people either listen <laughs> or they don't. I was like, well, that's probably a good critique. <laughs> oh, that's that's always a pleasant email to get. The, um, yeah, right. Well, you know, I usually yeah. read the bad ones more than I uh, pay attention to the good ones. Yeah. But the, yeah, I, I want to get to some of the um, influence of the ideas in a minute here, but I want to stay on the marketing for a second because like we, we saw that when we started um, FMS, um, I, I worked with Clayton, you know, I came up under the right. AWAI, I worked with Clayton, make peace. Um, and then I went and worked in the trader education space in the affiliate trader education space at the time and the newsletter world were completely separate worlds, right? There was no, like, you talk to small trader educators, they'd never heard of Agora. You talk to a publisher over on, like, the Agora side, they'd never heard of this space. Um, and over on that side, the, it was like, the whole thing was this internet marketing um, product launch model, which um, is essentially what, what you call hot list launch now. But it first started in, I think it was 2001 when, um, uh, John Reese had a traffic secrets launch that uh, Jeff Walker and he worked on. And it was like the first yes. internet marketing million dollar launch. And it was a huge success. And then that thread of marketing, I would say, is the other big um, info, info marketing thread um, that developed over you know the course of uh, a decade or more. Um, and when we were doing the uh, first conference, that was the primary promotional model over here. It was a much smaller space in terms of like the biggest businesses were, you know, like a five to $6 million business was big on that side versus um, where you guys were at. I think at the time, like might've been like 40, 50 million. I forget. Um, yeah. At that time. And then we, we put these two worlds together very intentionally. And we're like, these people should be talking. Um, and there was lots of, lots of crossover then, right? There was a lot of, a lot of like things started to grow and we ended up taking, I feel like two sides of this industry and kind of creating a new um, ecosystem that allowed for a lot of the marketing world, um, marketing agencies, things like that to come up because now they had customers all over the place. Um, but when I think about internet marketing and I think about our industry's publishing, I think of your innovations at the Daily Reckoning combined with um, that hot list launch model like that is like the backbone of the sales process um, that we yeah. still use today. Uh, yeah, I, I that that goes to what I was saying that that um, the internet made it possible to do things like the hot list uh, launch model because we could send out multiple emails just to warm up the list and then get people to opt into um, into an offer before we even send it out. So we could find out. That's why we call it a hot list because we could find out who was interested in, they would already have, have um, signed up to get the, the um, whatever the promotion is mm -hmm. prior to even sending it out. So, I mean, that's how the model works, but it was, a, it was kind of like a discovery. Like if we knew back in print days that we had a list of all the people who wanted to receive the, uh, uh, you know, the number 10 that we send out, if we knew that in advance, we would only mail that list and we would right. save a ton of money that way. So um, what Jeff Walker was doing back then, we learned a lot really fast because we were able to send out a ton of emails at a fraction of the cost and you could warm up a list. You could build a list of people that had already opted in to, uh, to get your sales piece. And then the, you know, the conversion rate on those hot lists is way higher than the general, but you can also tell if the copy's working and then you can start rolling it out to, to, wider and wider lists like we would do it uh we would build a hot list in af if it worked to whatever we wanted to see five to eight percent and then if that was good because we knew that audience was uh was was interested in what we were going to be selling then we would roll it out to our wider free lists and we would look for like i don't know if it was good it'd be like two to five percent and then if that was good then we would we would approach the other uh publishing units within agora and say, hey, we have something working here, which they can also see because we have an internal sales uh, sales report. Yeah. And so they were already sort of primed looking for copy that was working too. And then we might get, you know, we might get to one to 2% if we rolled out to a, a less 
a less aware audience. Um, but that whole model became possible. We were able to apply what we knew from direct uh, marketing in print to the internet by adapting um, to that hot list model. And we do use it today. Uh, we just did one, uh, as we're speaking, we just did one for uh, Jim Rickards two days ago that um, there were 180,000 people on the hot list. So there were 180,000 people who had uh, agreed to receive the, uh, the promo before it was even published. And that yes, list, a big list. chunk, yeah, a big chunk of that came from the affiliates mm -hmm. of the affiliate networks. Um, Chris Carroll, who works with us, um, has, is a big part of that world, as you know. Uh, you know Chris pretty well. Um, he worked. He worked with Jamie, for instance, and he worked with a, a, a network of people that he knows um, mm -hmm. to build the hot list. To a side, I think he said one hundred and twenty-seven thousand of that big list came from the affiliates um, who are less aware of, of Agora. They're less aware of Jim Rickards, mm -hmm. but because, uh, because the hot list copy was good, we were able to get a ton of people on there. And then it's the launch of a new product. I think we're three days in, we're at like 3 million, which is pretty good for these days after, yeah. after a couple of years of downturn yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah, that's really good. So um, on your day to day, besides running the business, though, like you write and you write a lot, and you have for yeah. So that this goes back to um, to the Wigan sessions. Is uh, I I stepped out of a management role and I have been writing daily, uh, and I have a writing partner. Rick Bernard writes with me. Uh, I'm working on another book, uh, one called Bum Fuzzled, which is going to be fun to uh, to launch in a few weeks. Um, and then also I've been doing uh, these podcasts or Zoom, Zoom casts and podcasts once a week. And uh, I think we're, we're gaining traction. So I'm getting more and more people from outside of the Agora universe who are interested in, um, in like I just uh, interviewed Safadine Amus, who's a writer. He wrote a book called uh, The Bitcoin Standard, which is an international bestseller and um, translated into 30 languages and without this format i don't think he would have talked to us he I, we are friendly through the mises institute but um i was able to talk to him and and yeah. uh, he'll be on the wigan sessions next week so nice. my so, goal here is to take everything that we've learned over uh, that i've learned over the last 17 years and expand it beyond the uh the internal walls of of agora yeah so what is it that you love the most about, um, I'd say, the content side of this business? Like, um, because you are like you've been producing. You're on another book, which I, I want you to tell in a minute the the story behind the name. But um, yeah, <laughs> you also have. But you've been writing. You've been writing um, it, about ideas that I know that the Austrian School of Economics is a huge kind of um, focus of yours. Um, uh, like, what is it about? writing and thinking and talking about, I guess, capital markets in the way that you do that, that, that you love so much. That's, that's could be a really long answer, but I'll try to make it short. I, um, I didn't study finance or marketing, uh, in school. I, in, as an undergrad, I was, uh, I have a degree in American short fiction, uh, which is a literature degree. And then my master's is in philosophy. So I was interested in ideas and writing from, from when I was, I remember walking on the beach in Hampton, New Hampshire, Hampton Beach with a friend of mine. And I was 15 at the time. I, I have a vivid memory of it. And, uh, and we were talking about what we wanted to do. And I, I remember saying, I'm going to be a writer. And I had no idea what that meant at the time. I had no idea about the publishing industry. I had no idea <laughs> what course my life would take. But I studied, uh, I studied writing, writing, creative writing, and uh, I read a lot of short fiction uh, to get my degree in undergrad. And then I studied philosophy because I was really interested in the core ideas of what, how society has evolved to the point where we're in right now. And then moving forward into my career, as a, a graduate student, that's where I, when I found Agora, um, I was going to St. John's, which is a small college in Annapolis. And I had the proverbial uh, experience of, 
uh, not having enough money to catch a bus. So we found, my wife and I found um, enough coins in the couch. That actually did happen to get on a bus. And I'm like, man, I really need a job. <laughs> and this is, this is a pre-internet day. So I went over to the Jobs Bulletin Board at St. John's College. And uh, John Ford, who's another copywriter in our industry, had just started at Agora. And six months prior to me, had completed the same program that I was in, the Graduate Institute at St. John's. And uh, Bill, he was working with Bill, and they decided they were going to um, develop a team of writers. So Bill had asked John to go find some potential writers. Um, so he went to St. John's and he put a little three by five business, uh, uh, you know, card, uh, index card on the bulletin board at St. John's. And I was looking for a job. I studied in philosophy and I was like, oh, here's a publishing company. This is cool. And it uh, was advertising for copywriters. And I was like, oh, that'd be interesting to learn about copyright. And I was thinking like law and like <laughs> how you protect your intellectual property. Right. But but what I ended up discovering very quickly that it was sales copy. And that was the beginning of what we called the pod, um, which was a group of writers. Um, it was the first group of writers that Bill and Mark um, started teaching the fundamentals of direct marketing to. And that was the beginning of my career. And this is the only job I've ever had since. Um, but the passion for the ideas um, came more from the stuff that I was studying in school. And I, and I say to this day, I, there's no way that I could do this job without the background that I have, because I'm interested in the ideas that, that move markets, how history impacts politics, how uh, economics are, have changed over the years. Um, you know, when we wrote Empire of Debt, we did an entire history of how economics have, have influenced um, the rise of the American empire and its uh, dependence on debt. So I'm fascinated by, by um, I'm mostly fascinated by the stupid things that people say about how the markets work and stuff like that. So I get on tangents and I start reading about them. And, uh, and then I learn stuff all the time. I feel like if I, you know, if I'm, if I'm actively engaged in the intellectual side of the business, then the mechanical side of like getting the offers right and stuff like that is worth it because, um, because then I get to, to read and write and, uh, and, and try to do the things that I, that I really enjoy doing, the stuff that I went to school for 30 mm -hmm. years ago. That's where I feel like with, with, with all the work and all the writing that you guys have done, I, I do feel like, there's a sense that I have that the influence that you have, and I think it's because you do this, you do put everything within this greater historical and political and um, philosophical context, which is what yeah. makes it like, I think one, you attract an audience that's, that's smarter. Um, people who engage, the guys who engage with you, they're engaging with the ideas. Um, you tend to have, um, uh, like, I know you've had lots of people like Ron Paul and people come through and other politicians, but I feel like <laughs> wherever I go, there's either people have heard of the motley fool and if they they've never heard of agora they've always heard of the daily reckoning mm -hmm. um and the people that i meet both in the industry and outside the industry that know the daily reckoning tend to be one um i don't say well wealthier definitely wealthier um uh and much more intellectually curious and like they have i don't want to say the they're not anti-populist. They're, um, they're actually contrarian, which yeah. is not, I would say, a, a huge part of the industry isn't necessarily like you have a lot of people who, who, who their, 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 their newsletters are just kind of like going with the trend of the day, the story of the day. They don't really have like um, this, I would say, intellectual, like strong intellectual underpinning to their franchise and what they think and why they think it and what they're exploring. And that's something that's always been so striking to me about what you have always done. Um, yeah, the way I look at it, um, and this is even when trying to teach other writers, uh, even experienced writers, we just try to identify who the audience is. And they tend to be older males, most of them are white, um, and they have uh, mastered some kind of financially valuable, valuable skill. So they have enough money to be worried about it. First thing they usually do is give it to a fund manager or um, take the advice of, of their, um, their financial advisor. And through a, 
a number of reasons, uh, market turns, bad ideas, um, products that people like financial advisors are trying to sell, they, they start losing their, they're either losing their money or it's not performing the way that they want. So they're, they're already sort of independent enough because they've, you know, they've run a business or they're a dentist and had their own practice or, uh, you know, they're a lawyer um, and they're, they had been so focused on their own trade that uh, one of the phrases we say is, oops, I forgot to get rich. So they were like compensated well um, from their client base or whatever, but they hadn't spent enough time uh understanding how markets work and the way the economy is unfolding. And uh, then they go start searching online and they find us because we're trying to explain things from a uh, macro perspective uh, that you don't often find in, um, in uh, you know, the mainstream media. We, we poke fun at the mainstream media all the time. And that kind of feels like a cliche, but we do it because ours is an alternative perspective and uh, because our readers are independent, they're kind of cranky, they have like pretty strong political opinions. Most of them are, are, are well-read themselves, well-traveled, um, and they have enough money to worry about it. Uh, they, they want honest opinions and they, and actually that's one of our phrases in the Daily Reckoning is we have opinions and we're not afraid to use them because we're, we're not looking to be objective. Right, uh, like, like you're supposed to be in journalism. We don't call ourselves journalists. Um, we're more like uh, armchair philosophers who have opinions about how the markets work. And, yeah. and we enjoy it too. That's the other thing is the writing is, we try to make the writing as entertaining as possible. We want to engage people on a level where they enjoy opening our emails or, or reading the newsletters that we publish because we're people and we have opinions. Right. And we, ha you know, we get challenged all the time too because uh, and we encourage people to challenge us because a lot, you know, we might be on a subject like gold confiscation in 1933 or whatever, and there'll be 10 or 15 people who read it, who know more about it than we do. And we're like, ah, oh, that's not what happened. So we get those emails and that helps us uh, mm -hmm. correct our points of view. And uh, it just, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a relationship rather than, um, that, that's the way I, I always try to describe it this way. We have subscribers and we use the, the term intentionally because people are subscribing to our point of view and they want to hear what we have to say. And that goes across all of the newsletters, but also the, the free marketing tools that we have. Um, and if they disagree or if we step outside of the line and say something that doesn't fit with that sort of worldview, then uh, they let us know right away. So it's kind of, that's why I say it's a relationship because it's, it's a two-way street. And that's really important to us uh, to maintain that. And I, just to go back one step too, I, re I remember it was, it was really difficult to get um, Empire of Debt written. I'm going back uh, 10, actually almost 15 years now, I was living in Baltimore after having been in Paris with, uh, with Bill for five years, and we had already published Financial Reckoning Day, and we were working on Empire of Debt, and Bill had just bought his ranch down in Argentina, was living in France, and was working with our office in London, so at any given time, he could be in one of three different locations, and I was working on the manuscript here in Baltimore. And I would have to kind of triangulate to figure out where he was going to be because we didn't do any work. Um, we did all our work in hard copy. So I'd have to figure out where he was going to be and then FedEx a manuscript to him. <laughs> and then like a week or two later, I would get the manuscript back and it would have all these like notes that Bill had written to himself that made no sense to me whatsoever, but he wanted ed edits made and all that kind of stuff. So we... We we did that for months, and it was it was much more difficult than um, than uh, when we did financial reckoning day. We were actually sitting at desks that abutted one another, and when we had you know had edits to make or whatever, we were just handing manuscripts across the desk. Yeah. But for this one, it was taking months and months and months. And then Bill came to Baltimore. He was spending like three months a year in Baltimore at the time, and uh, we got together and we were comparing notes. And um, I had. 
I had a, a structure for the book and I had already forward sold the book through Wiley into the trade as they call it. So it was already promoted in the journals so that like Barnes and Noble could buy advanced copies before it was even published. We had already established this whole kind of marketing side of the book. And I was working with the editors and marketers at Wiley. I had gone to the New York book show and promoted it. And then in, in this little editorial meeting that Bill and I had, He's like, um, Addison, I decided that I'm not writing The Empire Debt. I'm writing a different book. And he added like 120 pages written already. But it wasn't, it didn't relate to anything that we had forward sold into the, uh, into the trade. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I'm going to go back and see what I can do. But um, we already have a contract for this. And we already, we've already agreed that, and I think we've already have advanced sales on it. So they, uh, Wiley came back and they're like, no, we already sold this book. You have to produce it. So then uh, Bill was, I, it was another meeting. Bill's flustered and he's like, oh, I don't know why. Oh, this isn't the book I want to write. And I'm like, Bill, the reason why is because, I mean, this is why we got into this industry in the first place. Because because we're fascinated with these ideas. We can use the manuscript that you have for another book, but we still have to finish this one. So then he's like, all right, well, tell me what, what chapters to write. And so I just broke up the book into different chapters and it still took another six months. I think we were a year late on the, on the delivery of it. But um, that's just an example of, you know, we're both kind of, actually most, most of the editors who are engaged in the intellectual pursuit are much more focused on the ideas mm -hmm. than on, um, on the structure of the marketing and stuff. We, we, we're aware of all that and we know how important it is and we, train ourselves in it but um the ideas um the ideas are what are important one of the edits that i took out of empire of debt became the demise of the dollar which um, was a new york times bestseller and that was just on my name um and then the other book that bill was writing he ended up finally publishing as uh, mobs messiahs and market so out of the project for empire of debt um three bestsellers <laughs> were written and it's all because we were like so embroiled in our heads, just in the history of, of economics and stuff like that. Do you do you find with younger younger editors that are coming in that they you're finding people who have that kind of an intellectual curiosity about the um, the markets and about? It, yeah, we do. Context? There are a few really good writers who have come to us because they've read our stuff and they're like, "Hey, I want to get involved." and um, yeah, one that comes to mind is Chris Campbell, who writes, he currently writes for um, the uh, Altitude franchise. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, he was uh, writing this thing called Laissez Faire Today, which is a, he was traveling around to different uh, parts of the world studying how people uh, tried to express liberty and um, how they were making living, uh, making their livings off the grid and stuff like that. He, he, he's a very good writer. And he's a good example because he never went to college. He was a farmer for a while and uh, he was young when he came to us. He was only 24 or something like that. But he came because he was reading our stuff and he wanted to, to get involved. And uh, we did a little bit of training and then we kind of set him on his path. And, and then he just became, he's a very good writer. He's very entertaining and very personal. He writes in the same style that we do. So we do get a lot of that. But we also get a lot of people that come in with like a finance background and they want to publish a lot of charts and graphs and um, data from Yahoo Finance and stuff like that. And that usually doesn't work very well for us. The term that Bill and I came up with to describe what we do is literary economics, which is very different than a lot of the newsletters that you find out there. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's also, but I think part of the staying power that, that you guys have had in the readership that, that stays with you because it is it's it's a different thing than simply like here's a market analysis it's uh yeah here's what we think about what's happening in relationship like i think that the pieces of history just like it it, it elevates everything when, when you're relating it to this greater context and i don't even know if i feel like macro is one piece of it but it's almost like you have like a it's like a meta view right because you do things yeah. about like well people are saying this, but that's based on the assumption of this style of economics versus this one. Um, and this is, there's fundamental flaws with this one. And so everything else that they say then is flawed. And so like you have this meta view on, on kind of the whole 
economic kind of environment that we have that I think is um, really intellectually stimulating and it's challenging and it's interesting and it's not the mainstream view of things because the mainstream view is just kind of everyone's going to agree on some basic assumptions and then everything follows from that and you say whoa 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 these basic assumptions are flawed yeah. and that that's such an interesting thing yeah and um, we apply that that approach to economics of course but we also apply it to like the development of technology mm -hmm. And in the search for companies that are, are changing paradigms in the, in the technological world, uh, we apply the same approach that, that some, some um, techniques or ideas are self-reinforced within, within the institutions like universities and stuff like that. And if we find them faulty, whether it's uh, uh, financial advice or economics or the way tech companies are financed, Mm -hmm. um, or the way that they're actually, um, the technology is produced. There's a lot of interesting stories that just don't get told because they don't fit the, the narrative that is being, right. being told by the mainstream press. Yeah. And, you know, that, that brings up, you and I had a conversation once about kind of the, the mainstreaming of the industry and how, you know, as uh, the retail investor gets more more noticeably important as more and more other sides of financial are interested in kind of a content marketing strategy we're, we're seeing a lot of interest from other um areas of finance we'll say um and we're seeing kind of this mainstreaming of what we do um and i know you, you you're like i don't like it um but there's this thing that's that's very different about um the newsletter kind of world and what, what you guys do in particular and what, you know, a good newsletter does in general, which is it's always fringe. It's always like kind of on the edges of it's, you know, people don't pay for information that they can get for free from everybody else. So where do you see the, like the direction of the industry going? Where's that fringe kind of expanding to? Um, uh, what do you think of like kind of like the future of like the areas that we're going to explore? I mean, there's also the personality side, but like, yeah. how do you see the future of the industry developing? Well, I, I think that's a very interesting question because um, we, we had a phrase for a while that seemed like sort of was funny because we were always fringe, but then with the, you know, the, with the proliferation of podcasts and zoom casts and stuff like that, especially during the pandemic um, we're not, fringy at all anymore <laughs> like people have gone way farther out on, on the ledge than we have um and to the point where it's it uh in the in the latter days of direct marketing in print it was a very crowded market and you had to kind of be the loudest and have the most outrageous predictions in order to to even get noticed mm -hmm. and i think right now the industry uh online is going that same way for a while, like it was great being the only uh, email letter for a year or two. And then there were five and then there were 30. And then there were, you know, now there's thousands. Like yeah. now even having been there in the beginning and, and being responsible for launching hundreds myself, um, it, I think we're getting into that situation where you have to have really outrageous ideas to, to even get noticed, which I, I don't necessarily think is a good thing right. uh, because it, it it lends itself to just being outrageous for the sake of being outrageous um, and then also we're running headlong into this uh, cancellation and and deplatforming culture mm -hmm. we just saw like if you're not on board with the the western narrative of ukraine if you even write about uh the russian perspective you're in danger of getting uh getting deplatformed, even if you're just pointing out that, like I, I pointed out um, recently that sanctions hurt the Russian people more than they hurt the oligarchs. And by cases. extension, they also hurt uh, the West more than they're hurting the oligarchs. So that's not to say that we can't do something about it, but, but the narrative is that sanctions are going to, you know, ruin the Russian economy and that's going to make them change their mind about the war or whatever. Just pointing out that that's not necessarily the case, that the unintended consequences of, of the sanctions um, are equally as damaging to other people in the world. Mm -hmm. um, just pointing that out, we're like running the risk of, of uh, being, you know, running afoul of, of the, the platforms that we use to publish. 
Yeah. And, uh, and I, so I think that the industry is going to get really interesting because at the same time that you have to be more and more outrageous to get noticed, there's the, there's a, a sort of a counter pressure to fall in line with, with whatever narrative, mm. um, you know, I the mainstream feel. wants, wants to publish. And, and I think that that's going to be a, a big challenge for, for people like you and I, who just want to be independent actors and say what we think and analyze things. And mm. you know, it's, but it's going to be, that's, that's, that's a really critical kind of delineation of where we're at. Because if you look at like the history of media, like you go back to like the 50s and 60s when you had five news channels or four even, and it was like you're either a Walter Cronkite guy or you're a, you know. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> right. But there was one, but because of that, there was essentially one centralized culture. And then with the rise of the internet, the, the promise, right, the promise of it was this um, – after this this huge consolidation period, because prior to that, you had thousands of newspapers. So you had this disaggregated um, information market um, was that we were going to go back to this disaggregated, you have bloggers everywhere, everyone can have their own news stories. And we did have that for a while. But then with the growth of like, we went back through consolidation with like Google and Facebook kind of dominating advertising and everything. Um, and now with streaming platforms, you have the same handful of streaming platforms. And so when a new show comes out, everybody on all the social sites are talking about the same thing. So you have this consolidated um, media environment again. And I feel like, you know, we're, we're right at the a tipping point where something's going to happen here. And it could be all of this cancel culture that's coming, that's going to kind of explode it again to where there's in part of it could be the crypto um, side of things and how blockchain is promising decentralization, but there is something going to happen here. That's going to fragment this market again, because we are getting to a dangerously um, unified media environment where it is like a handful of people can just turn everybody off. Yeah, I think it uh, ebbs and it flows. Uh, and, we, and we've seen that um, just in the last 10 years where it gets decentralized and, and ideas get spread out. Um, but then in that type of marketplace, it's hard to gain a foothold and actually build a business because mm -hmm. we are, after all, in business. So we have to have uh, enough revenue to keep, to keep going. It's much less expensive to run the businesses that we do. But... Um, but you need to gain market share really uh, in, in the, the market for ideas. Um, and as it gets decentralized, it gets harder and harder to do. But I also think that that's why we start coming back together because we like, like people looking at Agora uh, marketing campaigns that work, mm -hmm. they go, oh, that, that works. I have ideas that are similar. So then you have, um, I hesitate to say copycat ideas, but you have ideas that get, used over and over again um, and so then you start seeing uh, a similar idea being propagated through multiple uh, multiple publishing companies really mm -hmm. right like, that that works I'm going to do a similar thing or you know we even train people to to get swipe files to figure out what's working yeah. and, and then try to uh, and try to figure out a way to take whatever you're working on and use the same techniques Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it expands and then it, and then it contracts. Uh, and I feel like we are in a contraction period right now, which is also forced just by economics alone. Like when um, like it, w there's a weird phenomenon that hard, happens in our business when the economy gets hard um, or it gets locked down, then people have to make choices about their own uh, spending habits. And even if we're right about what's going on, our analysis is cor correct. we forecast a recession or say we forecast a downturn in the economy forced by the pandemic um people still cancel our publications even if we were right about it their right. their actions are dissociated from the advice that they're getting from us they're just mm -hmm. saying if i have to cut things uh do i really need this subscription and they start cutting right. so we we are victims of the same economic forces that that we're writing about yeah so it, it that that forces a kind of consolidation too, where people are um, they gravitate towards the 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 marketing campaigns or the publishing companies that are more successful, and and then it sort of gets uh, uh, it gets consolidated even during a time when technology allows us to decentralize at a fast rate. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think also that the 
I had this presentation that I did for our accelerator group about um, one of the first ones I did actually about the impact of the um, the market cycle on media costs. And so right when you have those cracks, like when you have a real strong pullback, everybody loses um, customers, your, your bullish promos no longer work because they were working right up until the crash. Um, so there's a period of, of like that of usually about six months where everyone has to kind of change their whole promotional approach. And it takes some time to, to, to do that. Um, but then during that period, our media spend goes way down. Um, other ancillary industries like the um, kind of the, the investor relations world that spends a lot of money in similar channels, like their media spend dries up completely. And so ad costs drop. And then usually about 12 to 16 months after um, a big pullback, we have a huge front end comes out because it's kind of hits the sweet spot of where they found the right messaging, ad costs are lower. Yeah. Um, and uh, because of that, they can scale. Um, but I never really thought like to your well, point about, well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add to that, that, um, that you can scale more quickly too, because, uh, if, if there's a breakthrough, um, during the downturn, then all of the affiliates are looking for, for something that's working as well. Right. So you get, you get, uh, the attention of the people, like if a lot of stuff is working at the same time, it's harder to get the affiliates attention, mm -hmm. but if nothing's working and something breaks through, then it's, it's much easier to go out into the affiliate network and, and, and get new subscribers. Right. Yeah. And I feel like that, that idea of like the kind of consolidation and aggregation too, like we're seeing the, the rise of like, when you have it, when you have that kind of like fragmenting of the industry, you know, an uh, industry that already has a low barrier to entry and gets lower in the sense that like we're seeing now, like with Substack, um, with paid telegram channels, with like discord servers, like you're seeing like stock, like individuals creating kind of stock tip and investing paid services pop up everywhere. Um, but you, in those environments, they can't scale. And so I think, you know, I hadn't really considered it to your point that, um, you do need to like go from that phase into like when, when media starts to aggregate, that's when everybody's who's good and who has like uh, a pretty substantial business now because then they have, they have the capital can actually kind of scale dramatically. Um, and then yeah. obviously the impacts of that on the other side, when those, you know, whether it's a deplatforming on Google or Facebook, or it's um, just a weakening of their, of their advertising audience, then um, obviously that creates a, you know, a more, a more aggregate or fragmented media market makes it way harder to scale because you have so many different moving parts that you need to, yeah. to, to hit. So, yeah. I mean, another way that we call, uh, that we say it is that it, we, um, when everyone's scaling at the same time, it becomes a very crowded market. And that's also like you, like you're saying that that's when the prices rise because, uh, capacity for rolling out, um, gets crushed. Like if, if even if you have a good idea, if there are a lot of good ideas competing then then your ability to get into, uh, like the affiliate networks and, mm -hmm. and, uh, do cross promotions with people that diminishes because there's a lot of options and because the space is diminished, the prices go way up. It's basic yeah. supply and demand, but it, but it gets to the point where, uh, like, you know, the market might falter or the economy might stumble mm -hmm. and then people start pulling back and then you have the opposite. Yeah. But as a publisher, like that, those are some of the things that you have to watch. You have to be aware of like when greed packages are working, um, the market's going up, you know that it's going to be harder and harder to get space to, to roll your, your promotions out. Right. Um, and then also you have to be wary of what you're selling. Like in those markets, um, like small cap stocks and tech stories, mm -hmm. things that are, are on the front end of uh, opportunity, those stories will work and the macro won't work at all. Even if you have a robust macro program, uh, it doesn't work, but on the downside, and there is that, that lag period that you're talking about six months or so where it doesn't, it's hard to tell if, uh, there's going to be another leg up on opportunity or if it really is cracking. Uh, and then the only way to determine that is you mail both, you mail your, uh, greed packages and you mail the macro, the gloom and doom packages at the same time. And, and whichever wins then that you can start using the, uh, response rates 
right. as a way to determine where to put the resources that you need to, to develop up those programs. And if we're in a macro downturn, which I think we're, we're rapidly entering one, the yeah. success of this uh, Rickards promo uh, over the last week uh, indicates that uh, the way we've been saying macro is back because we all like the big ideas. Um, yeah. I think we're entering into that phase, but then you have to be set up to, um, to, to provide the ideas and advice that go along with that bigger narrative. Right. And that's the area we're entering into right now, I believe. Yeah, no, I think so. And I think obviously like the, you know, there's always, whenever things, um, pull back and, you know, you get into that macro environment, then there's just like the geo, when geopolitics matters. Yeah. Know? And stories about it become top of mind, obviously, right now. And so, yeah, if you're in like a tech boom and you try to talk about geopolitics, yeah. people, what? <laughs> yeah, nobody cares. If that Russia happens. invades Ukraine and and suddenly uh, everything from wheat to gas to uh, you know packaging goes through the yeah, roof, yeah. and you know for the most part, people are unaware. Um, mm -hmm. Then, then they they start looking for answers. And if you have, if you're prepared to explain what's going on, then that's a good spot to be. Yeah, it is. And I think that's, um, but that's where like having like a real strong view on, on the world. Um, yeah, that's actually, uh, this is interesting because I'm going to, I'm going to learn from this conversation even because uh, there's a section in Bumfuzzled uh, that I'm working on that. Um, talks just about how the media, how people are interacting with media and how it's mm -hmm. changed since we've had social media and how to think of it as, as a reader, as an investor, and even as a marketer or a publisher. Like mm -hmm. you, you have to be aware of the influence of the media itself. Because right. um, because like we're talking, that expands and contracts at the same time that markets do not always in unison, but, but um, our ability to, to communicate. Uh, sometimes it's easier than, than other times. Um, right. So there's a whole section in the book where I'm just analyzing the impact of, of communication tools on the way that we develop our ideas and how we publish them. And that's actually, um, so that's really interesting because again, talking about context, like one of the I would say major areas of conversation in, in media that, that, that we've had over the last several years that has nothing to do with um, markets directly, or I mean, it does, but it's, it's not about markets is kind of this issue of like the algorithm of fake news of um, spun news, right? Like you have like a lot of, a lot of what we consider the news cycle on a 24 hour news cycle is really just somebody sitting in the middle in um reading out and having people argue about the, um, the news releases, the, the, the kind of spun positions of two different sides, right? They're not talking about the ana analysis or just talking about like the, the press releases of two different sides as if that's the news. Um, and so you're taking this, again, meta conversation about um, media and the issues of surrounding it and then applying it to investing, which is again, contextualizing. Yeah the person's like things that are affecting everybody's life and that we're having these conversations outside of necessarily a newsletter, but you're putting it into the context of like specifically your readership, which I think yeah. is great. Yeah. I, I think another way of saying that, that is you can't ignore the medium that we use to communicate the ideas, like, mm -hmm. because the way that people consume their ideas is as important as the ideas themselves. And I'll just give you an example, uh, like the way uh, Trump used Twitter was very it, it sit, suited his style because he's very bombastic and mm -hmm. he's able to sort of like openly criticize people with 140 characters or whatever and then just walk away from the from the argument right um and it, he built a following on twitter but also like he uh uh ex accentuated his his personality mm -hmm. and a lot of people like glommed onto that and they're like oh yeah he's awesome because he says funny things um or incoherent things. He's fun, fun to listen to just because of that. But then also that's another example of he's saying things that don't fit the popular narrative. So he gets, he gets, uh, he gets deplatformed. That's another right. example. But, but the, 
but Twitter in itself is just one form of communication. We're doing another here mm -hmm. and then we're still publishing books. We still send out newsletters in print. Like the way that people consume the, um, the ideas is as important as uh, the ideas themselves because a person who's gonna sit down and read a newsletter by say like Mark Faber on the history of uh, the silicone uh, chip industry in Taiwan is a very different person that's going to respond to, um, you know, tweets from Donald Trump. Right. The weird thing about that, though, is often it's the same person. <laughs> like they'll be sitting down and reading one thing and kind of like, right. It takes a, it takes about two hours, sometimes more to read a mock Faber newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, but it only takes 20 seconds to read a tweet. Right. right so, right. um, I, I still haven't really wrapped my head around it, but I think that the, the <laughs> multiple channels that we use now, is it makes, makes uh, publishing more of a complex enterprise. But like all uh, technology, all innovation, we don't lose the old ones. We can still publish right. books. We can still publish newsletters, but we're now adding these other elements to, uh, to communication. And people are self-selecting how they digest the information and as publishers and marketers I wear different hats but as a publisher and a marketer I have to be aware of how the information is being presented to each one of those media hmm. and it's not always easy because you, you, you need uh, you need different skill sets for each right and there's some people that can do it all but but that's rare yeah yeah and it is like the intent like I'd imagine also you'd find that like the guy who's willing to sit down and read the newsletter um, maybe wouldn't really pay attention to the same to, to Mark Faber's tweets because his tweets aren't written in the same way. And, right, could be. Not, and so he could have a different experience there entirely. Um, that's a really yeah, interesting idea. Yeah. Going back to the skill sets too, I started doing these, uh, these Wigan sessions and uh, Mark Ford, who taught me how to write copy and how to, like you know the mechanics of marketing mm -hmm. and stuff like that he started reviewing them and he's sending me notes like oh this opening is really weak what's the headline you know you still need a lead and all that kind of stuff and all i could say was duh why don't i know that i mean we're still communicating <laughs> uh it's just in you know it's on video now right it means that you have to really be good at the skills to to think in terms of a headline, it's like live copy, right? You got to think in right. terms of the headline. What is the lead? Why should you read this? Why should you care? Like all mm -hmm. of that has to be right up in the beginning and doing it uh, on camera is a different beast than doing it in print. You get to edit in print, right. which is even a like if you're writing copy, that's one thing. But if you're writing a daily e-letter and I've done both, mm -hmm. like you get multiple days to work out your copy on an e-letter, your deadline is like, I try to get my stuff done by two o'clock. So you right, have, right. you got to figure out a headline lead, a why, what's, what's the benefit to the reader. You got to figure mm -hmm. all that out in three or four hours. Right. So it's like each one requires a different, I don't know. It, it probably occupies a different part of your brain. I haven't studied brain function that much, but yeah, it's like <laughs> it there's the same principles, like but they're applied very differently. The brain that are working at different times. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I'm going to let you go senior because I, I know it's like we're over our time and um, yeah, that's fine. I could, you and I could just, you know, and we have, we could just sit there and talk about this yeah. stuff forever. Um, and so maybe we'll do another one of these and dive into some other things, but yeah. Um, yeah, these, I, these conversations are better had at cocktail parties because yeah. <laughs> you can't talk forever. <laughs> but I appreciate, well, I appreciate you having it. me on. And, uh, and uh, what, you know what? What I should do is come back once I do finish Bumfuzzle because I'll be talking about this subject, but also I cover five different areas of um, our sort of like history mm -hmm. uh, in, in Agora Financial. So. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I'd love that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Addison. Yep. Thank you, John. Have a good one. Take care. Bye.